Hi everybody, welcome back. My name is Cliff Anderson and I'm a librarian at Vanderbilt University. This time around we're going to use Nets blocks to draw a painting. We're going to create circles of various sizes on the stage, trying to achieve something that resembles a work of contemporary art. Along the way I'm going to introduce you to the concept of variables, which allow you to label and then to make use of data more efficiently in your programs. We're going to also learn a few tips and tricks of the Nets blocks environment. So, Let's summon our inner abstract expressionist and get started. Our goal today is to create a painting composed of many circles. The history of making images with tiny dots goes back a long way, stretching all the way back to the post-impressionist painters like George Seurat. Seurat developed a technique called pointillism to represent scenes by combining colored circles of paint on a canvas. As you likely know, the fundamental element in computer graphics is called a pixel. A pixel is a single dot on your computer screen. Computers create graphical images by relating pixels on a two-dimensional matrix. The more pixels you have at your disposal, the better the resolution of your image. If your pixels become dense enough on the screen, you can no longer make them out and the pixels effectively disappear from view. That's what computer manufacturers mean when they talk about so-called retina devices. To be clear, we're not going to create an image working directly with pixels this time around. There are ways that you can manipulate pixels in Nets blocks, and I'll discuss those in a subsequent video. For now, we're going to simulate the experience of drawing with pixels by using circles and combining them on the stage to generate a work of art. Last time, we explored two different ways of making a circle. But why not? Let's simplify by making a circle in yet another way. All right, so what do we need to do? Let's start again with our control block here. I'm going to bring over this repeat block and I'll change the slot to be 360. And then I'm going to take a motion block and we'll take this turn one degree here. And then we'll have a move block and this will make the radius and I'm going to change that to 30. Now here's a slight difference from what we did last time. I'm going to take the pen and I'm going to put the pen down right here. Then I'm going to take the pen up right there. And then I'm going to take another move block right here. And then I'm going to put that as negative 30. So instead of setting the X and Y coordinates explicitly, we're just going to say move 30 in one direction and then move 30 back in the other direction but the second time around as you're moving back, don't trace the movement. All right, let's give it a shot, see if it works. Here we go. Circle, it's making a circle. So I'm gonna let you in on a secret. When we go sketching a circle, depending on how we do it, we're either creating a 360 degree polygon or we're simply putting up dots that are spaced out along the circumference at intervals that are too small for us to see. But in neither case are we actually creating a true circle. That's an illusion created by the fact that the pixels are so close together on the screen that our eyes can't pick up the difference. But if we made this circle bigger, we'd notice a difference. Let's try expanding the radius of our circle now to see how the circumference of our shape changes as it expands. All right, so in that case, I'm gonna take this, I'm going to set the radius to like 60, let's say, and then um, have to have an equal number back. And let's run this. Oh, let's clear the screen just so we make sure that nothing going on in the background. Whoa. The problem is it needs to be negative 60 steps back. Okay, so let's clear the screen and run this again. And we need to show. Here we go. Let's bring it back right to the center. Okay, let's try that again. So it still looks like a circle, but maybe you can notice it's a little rougher on the edges. Let's move that even bigger to like 120, and this time negative 120. Try that. 
And now I think you can see that you could definitely pick up on sort of the fuzziness here as the lines that we're drawing have white spaces in between. Let's go to even higher resolution here. Let's say two, 200 and then negative 200. Okay, so you can see now, I mean, it's a nice effect, but it's not drawing a perfect circle. You can see now that it has lines going out. And uh, in that case, if we want to fill those lines in to make it look like a perfect circle, we'd actually have to reduce the number of degrees that we use to, to make that circle. So we'd have to probably move it to like 0.5 degrees and then double this number of 360 to 720. Let's see if that works. Better, right? In any case, it makes a difference as you expand the radius how many times you need to mark that outer circumference with dots in order to keep the representation of a circle. And in fact, we can move the other direction. We can put points down on the circumference at intervals of two degrees and still achieve the smooth effect that we want as long as we keep the radius of the circle relatively small. So let's try this in the other direction now. I'm gonna say let's move 180 times around, but this time we're going to, to move with two degrees each time. And I will make this, let's say 30 and negative 30. Take a look. And you can see that the circle looks just like a circle. So what's the advantage of doing it that way? Well, the advantage of that technique is that our program will execute faster if we require fewer computational steps to create circles. It's kind of fun to see the turtle busily drawing circumference when you're only creating one circle, but it gets to be a drag when you're creating many circles, as we hope to do. So by reducing the number of computational steps, we speed up the drawing of the circle. In this case, we can effectively cut the time in half. Here are a couple other tricks and tips to make your computations cleaner and faster. Sometimes you want to hide the turtle rather than show that busy little sprite at work. If that's the case, you can drag over this hide block. Let's take a look over here and you can see under looks, there is a hide block right here. And if I put that at the top, here's the turtle right now. If I click it, the turtle disappears, but the drawing still appears. The sprite is still at its coordinate position, but it's no longer visible. If you want to see the sprite again, click the corresponding show block. So right here, put this at the end. And if we click it now, I'll just pull it off so we don't run it again. You can see that the sprite reappeared to view. Another nice trick is to use turbo mode to speed up your computations. Turbo mode allows NetsBlocks to take shortcuts when updating the stage. You can see that turning it on makes a huge difference when drawing shapes. When it's on, the green flag becomes a lightning bolt. And just look at the difference. So I will come over here and I'm gonna take, it's right down here, let's see, turbo mode, there it is. I'm gonna click on it and let's just, there's the lightning bolt and let's try it out. Well, did it do anything? It did. Let's move it over here, we can see. It just does it instantaneously, much faster. Okay. So let's begin developing our program. We're gonna draw circles of various random shapes, sizes, and colors on the screen. There's a block in the palette under operators that allows us to generate random numbers. We can use that block to set the high and low end of the random numbers using the input slots that the block provides. So we'll take a look over here and we say, pick random from one to 10. And so I can set this to anything I like. Um, let's just do this right now from, you know, well, I guess, let's, let's say from 10 to 30. And you see when I click on it, each time it's gonna give me a different random number that's within that range. Here is where we're gonna to need to introduce the concept of a variable. A variable is basically a label that we create for a value. It's like an alias or a code name for a value. When we create a variable, we can use it to refer back to that computation or any computation that produces a value. That's actually kind of a deep point that we're gonna come back to later. For now, what a variable allows us to do is to store a value, and if we want to, to update that value 
as our code runs along. So in this following example, we're going to use a variable to store the radius of the circle. By making the variable bigger or smaller, we'll be able to control the circle size and make different size circles on the screen. The reason I need a variable is I want it to be the same for moving the pen this number of steps forward and then this number of steps back to control the radius size. So I have to use the same random number each time. I don't want that to change as the loop goes around. So in that case, what I'm going to do is I will create our first variable. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to click on make a variable. In this case, what we want to do is create a radius variable. So I'm going to call it radius. You could call it anything you like, but it's typical to call it something that's meaningful. So radius. And now let's go over here to set it. And you'll see that radius appears as a variable. It's got a checkbox here, which means that it shows up on our stage. We don't really want it to show up on the stage. So I'm going to unclick that checkbox and you see it disappears. But when I drop down here, it, the set block knows that there is a variable called radius that we can assign. And I'm going to assign it to this random number. So now when I bring this in here, I can say set the radius to a random size between 10 and 30. Now the trick is I need to use it here because these two numbers have to be the same. So what can I do? Well, I can grab radius off the side here and I'm going to move it into that slot. So now it's going to be move radius steps, which will be the value of the outcome of the random number generator that we've put inside of the block. Now to go the opposite way, we'll have to do a little bit of math and we're just going to take an operator here and we're going to multiply that by negative one. So you can see here, put a negative one and then I'm going to carry that same variable over radius and there you go. So we're going to move radius steps and then we're going to move negative one times radius steps, which will be the inverse of the number of steps that we moved without changing that number until we've done our full loop. All right, ready to see it go? Let's move this off here, put it back here so we can see, and let's run. Okay, there's one size, there's another, there's another. But you can see that each time I click it, I'm getting a different size circle. And we can make it bigger just to get that sense of what's happening. There you go. Sometimes when you get up to 60 though, you can see the quasi pixelation that's taking place. So we don't really want to go that high in our drawing. Let's stay with 30 as our highest number. To create the illusion of painting, we also want to sign the location of the circle close to the previous circle. This will help us to maintain that kind of flow that you get in a painting, which does make it look like it was seamlessly coming out of someone's paintbrush. What we're going to do is we're going to bring over a motion block and we're going to say here, move 10 steps, let's say, and We'll also maybe just put it off at an angle. So we don't want to just say 10 steps or 15 degrees every time. That would be a little bit boring. What we want to do then is pick a random number again. So some number between, let's say, negative 5 and 5 degrees will turn. So that will be turning left or right. And uh, let's move, again, some random number between 1 and 10. Now, in order to have more than one circle appear on the screen, we need yet another control block. Let's go over to our controls and bring this down. And let's take a look at what we want. The one that I suggest we use, if I can find it here, is the forever block. This basically means just continue doing this loop forever until we hit that red stop button. So I'm going to take that and let's move all of this inside here. So now you can see we have two control structures, one encompassing the other, and we're going to put that hide and clear on the top. And let's see what happens. Oh, it went right off the screen. Okay, that's because we need one more piece here. We need a block to tell it if it hits the side of the screen to bounce back towards the middle. And fortunately, there is a block that does exactly that under motion. It's if on edge, bounce. So we're going to take that and put it right under our move. That should help us to prevent that from happening again. And let's right click on this and show our turtle. We'll put it right back here. And we're going to give it another shot. And you can see now that it's moving around. 
Let's change our radius to between 1 and 20, just to get a little bit more of a fine detail on the points that we're putting on. There, it's beginning to look a little bit more like an artist's brush, but we can actually make it even smaller, and I think that would increase the detail. Let's go to between 1 and 10. All right, now that's beginning to look like something, right? The last piece of detail that we want here is we don't want to just paint with the same color. We want to be able to change colors as we go along. So in order to do that, let's go over here to pen, and we can see that we have change color uh, by 10. And let's take that down here. And again, we don't necessarily want to change it by 10 every time. We might want to just change it by a little bit on one direction or the other of the scale. So, okay, we're going to go over and grab that random again, which is under operator. Let's put random in here. And let's change it by negative one and one. Just kind of every time we go through, we'll just subtly change it, which should give, again, that illusion of continuity. Try it again. And now it's beginning to look like a proper splatter painting, some kind of abstract expressionist. Well, I did promise you that we would do some painting. Uh, in the end, I think our painting looks a little bit more like Lee Krasner than George Seurat, but it's actually quite a nice effect, don't you think? So if only we could get Alonzo to sign it for us, perhaps we could go on the market and sell it. Wow, we covered a lot of ground once again in this video. We built our most complicated program so far, combining two control blocks, the forever block and the repeat block, along with random blocks. We learned how to create variables to store and to update values. And we also picked up a few tips and tricks of the NetsBlock environment to speed up our computations and to look, make them look more attractive. And then we made some art in the process. So that's a wrap for this video. Thanks for watching and look forward to having you with me next time.